So I wanted to say um, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Cindy Specht, Executive Vice President of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, the leading peer-directed national organization focusing on the two most prevalent mental health conditions, depression and bipolar disorder. Thank you for joining DBSA and our esteemed presenters for today's webinar, Treatment Choices, Tools for Success. Too often, individuals living with a mood disorder can feel like their fate and quality of life is in the hands of others, that they have no real choice in finding the best path for treatment and ultimately their future. In reality, there are a number of choices that an individual can make that could have a significant impact on their treatment plan. The DBSA Treatment Choices four-part webinar series explores how individuals can get back in the driver's seat on the road to wellness. Today's webinar, the fourth and the final in this series, reviews some resources and tools related to each of the four treatment plan components introduced in our previous Treatment Choices webinars and offers some tips to create and navigate a treatment plan that meets your unique goals for wellness. We'll be accepting written questions throughout the webinar and providing answers during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. To submit your question, type it into the questions box on your screen and hit enter on your keyboard or click on the mouse on to submit, click on the submit button. It's my great pleasure to introduce our two esteemed presenters today, peer specialist, trainer, and consultant Donna Dykstra and DBSA President Alan Doderline. Alan Doderline is president of the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, DBSA, the nation's premier peer-led mental health organization focusing on mood disorders. DBSA reaches more than 3 million people each year with current, readily understandable information about depression and bipolar disorder and empowering tools focused on an integrated approach to wellness. DBSA's reach is further expanded by its national network of state organization and chapters, offering more than 800 peer-led support groups, which provide life-saving, free peer support to more than 53,000 individuals seeking information and support on their paths to the healthy lives they want to lead. Donna Dykstra lives in Seattle, where she has a consulting and training business as well as providing peer support. Her particular interest is whole health and integrating physical wellness with mental wellness. She's partnered with DBSA as a trainer in peer specialist core trainings and veterans trainings for several years. She credits her own wellness and recovery to a wonderful mixture of traditional and non-traditional activities and an ever-growing network of support. Now I am going to turn it over to Donna. Thank you, Cindy, um, and thank you, DBSA, for the opportunity to do this. And I'm really pleased to be here and connecting with other people who are interested in a journey that is a self-directed journey to recovery. So as you'll see right here, we're talking about a key to success being starting with a plan. Now, maybe you might remember either the book or the movie, Alice in Wonderland. And not too long after she falls down the rabbit hole, she's wandering along the, the path, and she comes to a fork in the road. And she can't figure out, should I go left? Should I go right? And it just so happens the Cheshire Cat is sitting right there. So she looks up, and she says, pray tell, Cat, what road do I take? And he said to her, where do you want to go? And she said, I don't know. And he said, well, then it really doesn't matter, does it? And that's been my journey um, and the journey of a lot of people I'm connected with on um, wellness and recovery is coming up with a plan and knowing that recovery is possible. There's been this big transformation in the healthcare field, both mental health and physical health. And for a while, a long while, um, there was the traditional sickness model. And so when I was first diagnosed and sharing with other people living with mood disorders, the first thing that happened, for me at least, was experiencing symptoms that disrupted my life. And then the next step was to get diagnosed and, for me, to start taking medication. And then there were treatment goals. And the treatment goals were created by the clinicians who were in charge of my treatment. And they were primarily things like compliance, comply with 
prescribed medications comply with therapies and then stabilization. That was the big thing, stabilization. And directly and indirectly in the sickness model, you receive a lot of negative messages about a bleak future. The, um, the future, the dreams I hoped for, they're no longer attainable. We get that from the media. We get that from our own reading. And it was very discouraging and depressing. However, we have now come to a new approach. And that is the awareness that wellness and recovery are possible. And I know for me, that was a shock when I heard that. But we have now demonstrated all around the country and all around the world that wellness and recovery are possible for people living with mental health conditions. And people define that in a lot of different ways. Some people might say that they think wellness and recovery means never living with any symptoms ever again. Um, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse, Abuse and Mental Health um, Administration, says that mental health recovery is a journey of healing and transformation, enabling a person with a mental health problem to live a meaningful life in a community of his or her choice while striving to achieve his or her full potential. Some other people have um, other ways of talking about wellness and recovery. And for me, I tend to think of wellness as being experiencing a rich and joyous life, regaining the ability to live, laugh, and love. So not just the absence of illness, but a joyous life as well. And Recovery, we know, is holistic. So in a traditional illness-focused system in the past, we tended to separate people's mental health diagnoses and treatment from the rest of their life. Um, and so we didn't look at physical well-being. We didn't look at housing, employment, education, family support. And now we know that all of those are crucial for us on the recovery journey. And frankly, we've discovered the building blocks for recovery are hope and goals. And so that's where this new journey is taking us, this um, approach to self-directed care in a partnership with other people in our lives. So planning is part of it. First, you have to have hope. You have to have a belief. Recovery is possible. And sometimes that belief is right there with us, right at the very beginning of our experience of symptoms and diagnoses. And for others of us, we may give up hope for weeks or months or even years. And so some of what's important to move along in this um, journey is to have hope. And once you have hope, then like Alice was told by the Cheshire Cat, you have to have an idea of where it is you want to go and what wellness would look like to you. And what wellness looks like to you is not the same as what wellness looks like to me or what wellness looks like to a friend of yours. It's entirely individualized. So no more cookie cutter treatment plans and goals for us. And there are several really nice um, op, um, materials that we can use for creating a plan. Um, some of us, you know, me, I tend to go around all the time saying, I have a goal. I have a goal. I have a goal to get my paperwork done today. I have a goal to... Um, get my bills paid today. But um, some people, it's more helpful to have an organized way of thinking about creating a plan. And so on the DDSA website, there's a wellness plan on the facingus.org page. Mary Ellen Copeland has created a widely known, internationally known 
plan called RAP, which stands for Wellness Recovery Action Plan. And there's also a workbook that you can get either online or through Amazon.com. So having something like that to give you an idea of what are some of the components of a wellness plan if this idea is something new to you. Crafting a plan. Okay, you've got the hope, the possibility of recovery. Now how do you choose a goal to move forward with your mind, body, spirit, and community? Sometimes people will think about it and say, you know, I really wish I could. Or, well, before all this happened to me, I used to, or it probably can't ever happen, but, or I would love to, or I have always thought it would be interesting to, or maybe someday I could. And that's a way of voicing goals without saying the word goal, because many of us don't use that word on a day-to-day -day basis. But thinking about our lives and thinking, where would I like to go with my recovery journey? And these kinds of phrases, if we find ourselves saying them to ourselves or others, can help us identify some possible goals. Now, when you're putting together a plan, you might think this is a little silly, but there really is no such thing as an unrealistic goal. But there are unrealistic plans. So if I announce to you that I want to be an astronaut, and you can't see me sitting here, but I'm a late middle-aged woman um, who never took a single science class in my life, I don't think. Well, maybe in junior high. So I have no science background. I'm older than I think all of the astronauts. And you might say, oh, that's totally unrealistic. But what happens is you create plans with small achievable steps and then find the supports and resources that will help. Now, every journey starts with a step, a single step, and then another one, and then another one. And so good planning and good steps and supports and resources can help you move along the path. Now, maybe I will never become an astronaut because as I look at all the small achievable steps and I move through them one by one by one, I might move beyond late middle age to early senior to late senior. By the time I get through physics, that right there could take me a few years, you know? Um, but at least I am moving towards a goal that is important to me. When somebody else sets a goal for you, yeah, you're not so committed to it. You're probably not interested in working hard to achieve it because Recovery is hard work, but when you own the goal and you've got plans with good, small, achievable steps, that's something that you're going to work towards. Now, in the process, it's helpful to avoid what I call all or nothing thinking. So an example with my astronaut dream might be, I might say, the only way my goal will be achieved is if I am on the next launch to um, the International Space Station and nothing else will satisfy me. Well, that could be problematic because I'm then saying there's only one thing as opposed to moving along, taking steps, and making progress, measurable progress. There's also something when you're working on a plan and goals that is interesting to me. It's got kind of a fancy name, and it's called the abstinence violation effect. And that is when 
we make the mistake in our goal setting and our planning of saying, okay, I have to 100% do this or never do this again. For instance, maybe I might set as a goal that I'm going to run a marathon and I'm going to start training today by running three miles. And so I run three miles today. Well, not really, but I might. Um, I work on running three miles today, and then tomorrow it's pouring down rain, and so I say, eh, I don't want to run today. And then I look at it and I say, oh, wow, I totally blew it. I feel so guilty, so awful, so inadequate. I guess it's hopeless, and so I won't even try anymore. So those are a couple of the pitfalls that we can run into. Now, I like this quote by Louisa May Alcott because she talks about far away there in the sunshine are my highest aspirations. And I may not reach them, but I can look up and see their beauty and try to follow where they lead. So that's something that motivates me when I translate dreams and hopes and wishes into goals. Um, and goals are, again, one of the foundations of recovery. Cindy? Okay, Cindy, I think that's yours. I'm sorry for the delay. I was on mute. <laughs> it is definitely mine. So thank you, Donna. Um, thanks, everyone, for your patience. Now that we've got some information to help us create a plan, we'll spend the balance of the presentation reviewing some tools and resources that support each of the four wellness plan components that we introduced in our three previous treatment choices. Those components are medical or biological treatments, talk therapy, support options, and lifestyle and personal strategies. Alan, will you start us off? Pleasure. Hi, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's my pleasure to continue. I'm Alan Doderline, and uh, I'm grateful to Cindy for uh, starting us off and to my co-presenter, Donna, for her perspective and background, which are invaluable for this uh, kind of presentation about how you get a plan together. And in terms of the building blocks, we identified some of the key ingredients that would go into a typical plan for many of us. Now, these plans will be as different as we are. And I need to stress that we at DBSA are not a clinical organization, and we don't provide uh, clinical direction. Uh, we're not the doctors. We are the people with the lived experience. However, we do want to reinforce one critical thing, which is that we do have choices about what we include within our own wellness plan, and that to do this decision-making in the context of a plan is incredibly important. And so that's what I'd like to reinforce and what I'll highlight in uh, the next few areas of a given wellness plan are the ways in which we can educate ourselves about what the different choices we have are. So I'm going to start off uh, with the next slide. Uh, the plan component of medical or biological tools and resources. So these are uh, some of the things that we might think of um, being the, the more traditional treatments. You know, I think there was a time when you would hear treatment uh, for a mental health condition and you would think of a, you know, medication that you would take, a pill or something like that. And I think we've evolved uh, beyond a notion that that is somehow um, all or, or even sometimes the main thing that you do. Um, but it is still, uh, in many instances, helpful for folks to consider some kind of pharmacologic treatment or other medically-based treatment, which might occur with uh, a device or, or uh, the application of uh, electrical currents. And that's, of course, 
uh, you know, ECT or transcranial magnetic stimulation. Those are some device-based ba device treatments. Uh, the majority of them do tend to be the small molecule treatments that we think of when we talk about medical or biological treatments. So in the next slide, we list some resources for learning about the when, why, and which. So uh, educating yourself about what some of the medication or device options are and when they would be applicable, when they might be uh, in order for someone to elect, um, why you would uh, choose a particular uh, avenue of treatment, a particular compound, and then deciding on the right one. Now this is something that is of course done in partnership and close collaboration with your clinical advisor. That can be a psychiatrist, it can sometimes be a general practitioner, uh, it can be a nurse practitioner. There are many different individuals that might be part of prescribing for your treatment plan. But there's a, a really helpful analogy that I love that was presented to me by one of our uh, treasured advisors, Dr. Gary Sachs from Harvard Mass General Hospital. And, and he talks about the idea that the person who's receiving treatment is the captain of the ship. And the clinical advisor, the doctor, that's the navigator. Now, a good captain does well to listen and communicate really well with her or his navigator, but ultimately the decision about where to steer the ship belongs to the captain. And, and I really like that analogy because ultimately we need to make the choices that will um, fit into our lives and fit into these plans and goals we set for ourselves, as Donna said. So some of the resources you might use to determine what kinds of, of treatments are out there include the National Institute of Mental Health website, which we list the link here. And we wanted to actually let you know some of the searches to do because the NIMH website is incredibly vast and has a great deal of information. If you do a search on mental health medications or on brain stimulation therapies, those two searches were the ones that we suggest to educate yourself about some of the treatments from that trusted resource online. Additionally, additionally the DBSA website, dbsalliance.org, has two pieces that uh, I would urge you to take a look at. The Finding Peace of Mind brochure, which is available for download, and the Treatment Technologies brochure. And, and Treatment Technologies lists some of those device-based uh, medical interventions, and Finding Peace of Mind deals with uh, some of the more traditional pharmacologic interventions. Then there are some phone apps, and, and these are some suggestions that we have from various participants uh, and staff members. This isn't an endorsement of you know, these particular apps, which are uh, in, in each of the slides I'll cover. The, the apps are available in uh, either your uh, iTunes uh, store or uh, in the Google Play store for Android, um, except in one instance that we do indicate. So, um, these are some things that you might try, apps about medication, specifically the WebMD app or the Psych Drugs app. And then these actual webinars that we're doing the final one of today um, really do have a wealth of information about specific treatment. Um, so the idea of what the general categories of choices are in the Understanding Your Choices webinar, uh, and then specific uh, options for bipolar disorder and for depression. Those are three different webinars that you can access by going to our website slash webinars. And we'll go on to the next slide. And here is a screenshot of our website. And you can see that uh, the uh, path is, is on the right-hand side there where you can go and, and actually uh, access some of the uh, key steps to finding the right treatment. Uh, going to dbsalliance.org, the wellness options, uh, nav bar, and then finding the right treatment uh, there on the choices menu. And you can see recovery steps, partnering with a clinician, understanding medications being the one that's pertinent here. So that's uh, what it'll look like when you go and look on the DBSA website. And we'll go to the next slide. So then, once you do elect a treatment, 
it's very helpful to track your progress. And that's something that I don't know that everybody uh, makes the, the time and effort to do. Some of us don't like to do it, and so that might not be right for you. But if you can uh, take it on, it can be really helpful for understanding you know, whether a particular treatment is working for you, and then what interactions or side effects may be caused. And, and sometimes in the moment, things might seem incredibly significant or they might seem insignificant, but if you can look at them over time, which this tracker idea allows you to do, it can be really helpful. It also gives you a tool that you can use in partnership with your clinical advisor. So I really recommend looking for uh, uh, a tracker uh, option. And then, of course, I'm very fond of the DBSA wellness tracker. You can look at that on our website again at slash tracker. And uh, it's also available as uh, an app. The wellness tracker is available now for uh, both iPhone and Android uh, just this November. So we hope you'll check that out. In the wellness tracker, you can look at, of course, the medications and side effects. But then concurrently, you can also look at the effect on your well-being and mood, what symptoms you may still be experiencing, life events that are occurring for you, and physical health. So you can look holistically, as Donna said, at everything that's going on, not imagining that it's only about you know, what's happening from the neck up. It's looking at all of the different facets of your life, and, and including um, you know, what you're doing, who you're interacting with, all of that is at play. And you can track it all in one place with the wellness tracker, uh, both online and in app form. And then one thing that can be challenging for many of us is to uh, remember to take medications. And sometimes you do take more than one. And so to have an app that helps you with reminders like MedCoach or the um, cutely named Pillboxy, uh, those are some apps you might try. Uh, and again, those are ones that have proved useful for some of our members. We'll go to the next slide. And now we're going to talk about another component, and this is talk therapy. And I have to say, when I was first diagnosed with uh, mood disorder, I was 17 years old, and I, um, I had no idea that there were different types of talk therapy. I thought you went and you, you know, I had the sort of stereotypical go and lie down on a fainting couch and talk with a guy in glasses, and um, we would talk about my feelings and my dreams and, you know, a very stereotypical kind of concept. And actually, that can be sometimes what you do. Uh, but there are different modalities, different ways of engaging with talk therapy. And that's something that's really important to consider, that you might benefit from a particular kind of talk therapy treatment more so than another. So in the next slide, we'll again look at how you can learn about the different options you have. Once again, the uh, website uh, include NIMH, and uh, you can see a uh, search on psychotherapies, and you can learn about the various different types that there are, again, with the Treatment Choices webinar series. Uh, and that really does provide some great information in the Treatment Choices for Bipolar Disorder and the Treatment Choices for Depression, some of the particular applications of different kinds of, of talk therapy. So that can include cognitive behavioral therapy. It can include dialectical behavioral therapy. It can include interpersonal social rhythms therapy. Uh, and that's uh, another um, you know, emerging treatment that uh, was developed by uh, Dr. Ellen Frank. And she's actually one of the presenters for um, these treatment choices webinars. And so uh, another one to consider uh, sharing is uh, this interpersonal social rhythm therapy site, ipsrt.org. We'll go to the next slide. And again, this is just uh, a way that you can take a look at what you'll be seeing when you navigate. In this instance, you'd look at the Understanding Talk Therapy link from the Wellness Options uh, tab. And then the idea of support mechanisms, how you ensure that the environment you're in and the uh, um, resources you have already available to you can be maximized and used so that they're reinforcing rather than getting in the way of the goals that you've set for yourself. And, and I think it's really important to think of it in that way, that, that you're building those things that help, and you're minimizing or, when appropriate, eliminating those things that hurt. And again, the, the, the idea is that you want to build your network. This can include people who have the same or similar lived experience to you, your peers. Of course, DBSA is well known and has for all of our now 
30 years in existence had free in-person peer support groups. And you can see what support groups may be operating in your area by visiting our website, dbsalliance.org slash find support. And you'll see there a map, uh, and you can enter your zip code, do a certain number of mile radius search, and see what's in your area. If there's not one in your area, um, we have many resources for helping you to start one. Uh, but also in the meantime, you can access our online support groups at dbsalliance.org slash OSG for online support group. Uh, and then there are also uh, some groups, uh, specifically DBSA groups, presented by um, the organization Depression Recovery Groups. Uh, and so that's another online support group option. And there is, in the interaction you have in social media, the opportunity to get support from peers. People do provide um, you know, uh, supportive comments, and there's a dialogue, and, and a kind of social interaction. We say to exercise caution, though, because um, in, in many instances, social media, Facebook, et cetera, Twitter, can be a uh, very supportive and, and welcoming interactive environment. In other instances, we know all too often, it can be as much or more a trigger. It can have some negative influences. And so I, I say that social media is an option, but it's one to use cautiously and, and consider very carefully. Uh, family. Again, family can be, for many of us, some of the uh, best and most important supports. There can be other instances where uh, history or, or interactions and, and personal styles can get in the way. And so this is something that I really think education is so important. Um, helping yourself to learn more about your condition is part of the process of deciding what treatment to elect and, and what uh, kinds of things to include in your wellness plan. But remember, you're also uh, dealing in many instances with family members and loved ones who don't know much about these conditions. And so really taking them along with you on the journey of learning about these conditions can be a way that they can understand more about what's going on with you and also more about what's going on with this particular particular diagnosis. And that can be really powerful for kind of getting your family and close loved ones on your side. There are also family and friends and caregiver support groups that are offered by DBSA. And then, of course, our wonderful colleagues at the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, are well known for their incredible uh, family support groups and their great family-to-family -family education program. And then there are various supports that exist in communities and that may exist in churches, synagogues, and other uh, places of worship. And so uh, the final category we list here is community or spiritual supports. There are community mental health centers across the nation. Um, an example of one in the Chicago area is Thresholds. Thresholds.org is their website. And you can find more information about some of the uh, mental, community mental health centers by going to the National Council for Behavioral Health website. Uh, and then there are also some clubhouse programs, clubhouses being uh, a sort of non-threatening and, and non-medicalized environments in which to um, interact uh, in various ways with uh, uh, peers, which may be dealing with a number of different things, including mental health. And uh, for more information about the clubhouse movement, you can visit uh, iccd.org. And then the idea of uh, religious and other social support uh, centers, these don't necessarily deal solely or, or even primarily with mental health, but they can touch on and provide some of the human interaction and hope that is so necessary for these journeys. And so again, if you are a member of a particular faith, that can be something helpful. Um, or some of the uh, community resources not around mental health can be things you may wish to access to build up those support mechanisms. And those are just a few of the building blocks. And I'm going to turn it back over now to the wonderful Donna Dykstra to talk a bit about some more plan components. So thank you, and take it away, Donna. Thank you, Alan. Um, as Alan mentioned, part of our circle of support in recovery often will be people with clinical perspectives, because they bring um, wonderful knowledge and skills to the table. But 
in what we have learned about wellness and recovery, we've also discovered that what you and I do on a day-to-day -day basis to take care of ourselves helps us to set and achieve goals. So whether you go to the DBSA um, toolbox to look at their wellness tracking plan, or whether you use a RAP plan, a wellness recovery action plan, or other plans, I think virtually all of them will talk about the idea that there are personal strategies that might be helpful for us. And I think every one of the things on this page, if you're interested, you can find that there's actually some research support that says these things can be helpful to our mental and physical well-being and helpful to our recovery. So, you know, some of the things that often go onto a plan would be what specifically are wellness strategies that I want to use on a day-to-day -day basis to help me stay strong and healthy so that I can move along in my journey. So certainly sleep is something people find very important. Um, nutrition also. And exercise, and actually sometimes instead of exercise, which has kind of a negative connotation, you know, that's what we set a goal for every New Year's, right? And then we might have that um, failure and feel frustrated. So maybe substituting activity even for exercise. Um, more and more people are finding things like relaxation and mindfulness are important and helpful. Social engagement, so having connections, having friends, having perhaps peers with similar lived experience, having family members, um, going to the YMCA and connecting with people there. Another area where there's been quite a bit of study talking about the wellness benefits is giving back to the community, whether that is the annual breast cancer walk in your community, or it might be um, some sort of a um, program where there's an elderly person who needs work done on their health, on their house, and there's a work party put together for the weekend. So that also has shown um, value for recovery. And of course, there's the good old time with animals. And if you happen to notice my picture right up on the beginning, you, you notice that I had a couple of dogs with me. But there's um, a lot of value to time with animals and their unconditional love that they give us. And also, they can help us make friends if we're a little um, introverted, a little shy, um, if we're having some tr trouble with withdrawal. Because take a dog for a walk, and it's amazing how many people are going to reach out and say, oh, what a nice dog. What's your dog's name? So that's another easy wellness strategy that people sometimes use. Okay. It's not changing. You're going to have to click on the white space, Donna. Yeah, I'm clicking there you go. on. Okay, there we go. Okay. So daily self-care goals are something that people often find helpful to put in their plan, whether it's a wrap plan or some other plan. And these are some examples of self-care goals. And these are not those gigantic kinds of things that might um, result in world peace. On the other hand, for those of us who are going through some struggles, these can be really gigantic to us and take a whole lot of work and energy. So things around sleeping might be going to bed at a certain time. Ah, yes, those smartphones and tablets and computers, get rid of them, maybe. Um, somebody might say, oh, noise-canceling headphones, or um, another possibility 
might be nature sounds. Um, nutrition. And, you know, it's, it's easy, again, to go to extremes with some of these goals and say, okay, by um, three months from now, I will have lost 90 pounds. And then if we have difficulty with that, to sort of fall off the wagon and give up and give in. So a daily self-care goal might be to eat clean one meal a day, and meaning by that to eat um, fresh fruits and vegetables and um, um, lean meat, if one eats meat or fish, and nothing packaged. So for one meal a day. Or somebody might say, OK, what? What I want to do every day is no caffeine after 2 in the afternoon. Um, exercise or activity, playing fetch, or walking mindfully for a block. Um, some other examples in that relaxation and mindfulness. Write down one item I'm grateful for every morning. That's what part of my daily um, self-care goals. Every day, I actually have a, a list of things, a kind of a checklist that I go through. And one of them is writing down an item I'm grateful for. Because I have found, for me, if it comes to the point where I'm not able to come up with something I'm grateful, that's one of those warning signs for me. And so then, in my plan, I also have tools that are in there in case the, the warning signs show up. There's the writing in the journal. There's um, social engagement, so calling my sister, leaving the house, or having a conversation with somebody by 11 each day. Or this is another one that was a self-care goal for me for a long time, and that is take a walk and make eye contact with and smile at three people. And of course, these daily self-care goals they change over time depending on what's going on in our lives and where we are in our recovery journey. So sometimes as we're pursuing those goals, the daily self-care and the bigger kinds of goals, we might run into challenges. And negative self-talk is a well-known challenge. So things like positive affirmations, um, there's something called catch it, check it change it. So catch yourself doing it, check it, compare it to reality, and then, if necessary, change the negative self-talk, spending time with somebody, support groups or peer support, something physical that distracts me, um, progressive muscle relaxation, taking a brisk walk. So these are things that I like to build into my plan as well because I know there are going to be times when um, challenges come up. And I don't view them as problems. I view them as challenges. And I like to have, in advance if possible, some plans for how I'm going to um, respond. So we mentioned here some of the other tools that are available. There's several apps, many apps, actually, around sleep. And one is. I sleep easy. Um, in, in working out, in exercise, and being more active, there's um, things like pedometers and Fitbit. And um, again, in the facingus.org page, we've got yoga. And there are things like Map My Walk, which will guide you and tell you just how many um, miles you walk or how many blocks that you walked. There's um, nutrition apps. And for each one of these where there's apps, there is also on websites some similar sorts of things. So if you do a search, I discovered every one of these apps, when I searched for them, they also yielded websites on the computer in case you're not somebody who has a smartphone. And um, there's a lot of people who don't have smartphones, but either in our own homes or at the library, we have access to computers so we can go to these websites. Um, take a break for relaxation and mindfulness. Belly bio interactive breathing is a fun one. Um, 
you put your device on your belly and you breathe in and out according to the rhythm. Um, there's meditations. Um, Meetup.com for social engagement. Right after 9-11, when all across the country there seemed to be a real connectedness and a feeling of community, some people said, you know, we need to have that on an ongoing basis. And so they started Meetup.com. And you go to Meetup.com, and there are groups in your community for almost anything. Um, there are groups for knitting, and there are groups for stair climbing, and there are groups for fishing, and there are groups for book clubs. So that's a way to meet people, connect with people, um, if you're not sure how else you could do it. Um, there's the BBSA web wellness tracker again. Um, building resiliency, that's a fun one because it is one of the most upbeat sites I have ever seen. And there's so much praise and excitement and celebration as you um, track things. Um, there's a virtual hope box. And that's something that oftentimes you'll create along with a um, clinical partner so that there are things that can go in there that you're working on with your treatment provider. And there are also things such as affirmations and videos that you can add. When we're thinking about recovery, we tend to look at recovery as having five stages. And in those different five stages, we often set different kinds of goals. So starting on the left, that's the impact of illness when the person's overwhelmed by the disabling power. And sometimes people will go and move into life is limited, where we give up and we give in. And we feel little or no hope. We may not be happy. We may be quite dissatisfied. But we think this is the best that there can be. Um, change is possible when you get that little flicker, that fragile flame of hope, and then commitment to change. So you start challenging the idea of the disabling power of a mental illness, and then actions for change when we start moving beyond. So the different kinds of goals that we might set and the different kinds of resources are going to be different as we move around in those different stages. And I don't want to communicate that somehow that it is a linear process, and you start on the left, and you go up and around, and, and but actions for change, and oh my gosh, there you are, you're recovered. Because for many of us, certainly myself included, um, I might be at one stage, and then next week I might be at another stage, and then next week I might be at a different stage. But we find this kind of helpful as a way of thinking about our recovery and the idea that recovery is possible and that there's a process and there are ways of moving along in our recovery journey. So I've got 10 steps for accomplishing a goal. And in addition to these steps being here, um, and so you can, you'll, you can reference them um, after this, they're also on the DVSA website. But just to think about when you set a goal, what are some ways to accomplish it? And so the first one is state a positive goal. So rather than I want to stop smoking, it would be positively stated as I will be um, tobacco free. And then you give yourself a time frame, because that helps you to come up with steps for that. It's helpful if you take a look at the costs and the benefits. So why do you want to do this? How's your life going to be different once you achieve this goal? If, if, it, if it's hard work, and it generally is, to achieve goals, that means stepping outside of our comfort zone. Often, it's helpful to look at the costs and the benefits. If I do this, how is it going to improve my life? 
if I don't do this, what's it going to do to my life? Um, you've got to take a good look at things that you've got going for creating the kind of future that you want, um, as well as what are some of the challenges, things that might keep you from getting in the way of the future. And especially watch out for that danger of negative self-talk. That is one that, for many of us, is um, a common challenge. And so in this plan, stating clearly what self-talk you want to watch out for and how you're going to fight it. Then be clear about what you're going to need to achieve this goal in terms of skills, resources, support systems, etc. So I need the following skills. I need to get resources. I need to develop um, supports. Then what are three to five major actions? And how are you going to get started by doing those things? So again, you're not having a plan where you step from where you are today to full accomplishment of the goal tomorrow, but rather actions. And then how are you going to take care of yourself? So those wellness and self-care tools, um, focusing on what it is you want to create, not the difficulties you might be having. And finally, be gentle, be easy on yourself, have fun, enjoy it, enjoy life. So take care of yourself and what are you going to do to enjoy life? Um, and again, many people say if they take the time to put these things down into writing and review it, it's um, a helpful way to move on with goals. So when you do this, you're going to be stepping outside of your comfort zone and taking some risks. So we talked again about what would be a first step in moving in that direction. Something that I find helpful is to get an idea of your personal style and decide whether you want to build on it or challenge it. So by that, I mean, for instance, um, are you somebody who prefers to do things by yourself versus as part of a group? And then, in pursuing this goal, is it therefore something you're going to do by yourself and that's what works best for you and you know that? Or perhaps you want to challenge that part of you and say, you know, I think I want to try doing something as part of a group rather than all on my own. And you might have reasons for it. For instance, you might discover, you know, when I've tried doing it on my own in the past, I didn't succeed. Um, I would forget to do it. I gave up. I didn't know how to do it. And so that might help you decide to challenge your personal style. And taking that first step, again, you have to first learn a new skill. You need to find a particular resource. You need to find or create a supporter for motivation and encouragement. All of these different things that we talked about today um, can lead you to the tools for moving on in your recovery journey and um, having success in accomplishing the life that you want to have. So I would end this with a quote. Um, that says, become the leader of your life. Lead yourself to where you want to be. Breathe life back into your ambitions, your desires, your goals, your relationships. Thank you. Cindy? Thank you, Donna. Really what you guys have been talking about today, and particularly this idea of creating a plan, is really pivotal. We talked throughout the whole series about how you can make choices on all four of the treatment components, but really what are going to drive those choices are going to be the plan that you create, because that's going to be your goal. You're going to use that as your guard, yardstick then in terms of how much and which and uh, of each of these components you're going to integrate into your, what we've been calling your wellness bouquet. And again, and a reminder that you know everyone's bouquet is as different as they are personally, um, because everyone has different circumstances and everyone has different goals. And ultimately, they're going to have a plan 
that is unique to you, and and hopefully you can then use that plan to be able to um, create a create a treatment plan that actually helps fulfill and help manifest those goals. So I want to. Thank everyone. Um, before we move on to the Q&A, I do want to take a couple of minutes in case someone needs to leave early. Um, we are running a little late. I'm going to ask our presenters if they can stay for 10 minutes to make sure we get some time for Q&A. I wanted to remind everyone that um, there are additional resources on dbsalliance.org and or a, a shortcut resources after our website. This PowerPoint is available currently um, at dbsalliance.org slash webinars. Um, and the archived version of this PowerPoint will be available a little earlier this time. It will be available um, as of Saturday. So by the end of this week, an archived version of this will be available. So if you want to refer other people to this webinar or any of the treatment choices or the DBSA webinars in general, we would appreciate that. Um, we will be sending you a post-webinar survey. We hope you'll be able to provide some feedback to us. It will be sent to you in email. And we really do value your input on that. Um, we want to take the time now to thank um, uh, our presenters for the time and expertise uh, given by Donna Dykstra and Alan Doderlein. I also want to thank um, Synovian for the generous support of the production of the webinar. And I want to thank each of you, our peers and partners, for joining us. And we hope you found the webinar informational and helpful, and um, that you'll again be able to provide us some feedback so we can continue to improve as we present these webinars. Um, if you'd like to stay tuned for future webinars from DBSA, um, we ask you to check that webinar uh, shortcut page and or be sure to sign up for um, monthly e-newsletters that will have all of these things promoted in them um, at dbsalliance.org forward slash join. So if you haven't already done so, I would ask um, anyone to enter your questions into the uh, chat box or the question box on your screen. Again, um, our, we have a couple of minutes, and I'm going to make sure that we stay for at least uh, 10 minutes or until we run out of questions before that um, to be able to address any of your questions. So if you can bear with me just a moment, I'm going to see what we have in our question box, and, and we'll, go from, we'll go from there. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, someone just asked, I'm going to do a couple of quick things here. Someone asked if previous webinars are available in, in a, on the library in our site. Yes, it is. It's the dbsalliance.org slash forward, forward slash webinars. Um, um, someone else was generous to be able to provide a suggestion uh, for another app. They suggested that the Mango app for medication reminding is awesome and that they use it um, on their iPhone. I'm pretty sure it's probably available in Google, um, Google Play as well. Um, uh, there's um, some information here, and I would open this up to Alan and to Donna on this. Um, person is living without insurance, and um, they go to a low-income clinic, um, and so their psychiatrist and that person only talk about medications. I was wondering if there was any legitimate therapy available online. If you go back to, before I turn it over to Alan and to Donna, um, we mentioned um, in um, the presentation today that um, Dr. Frank, gave some information for interpersonal social rhythm therapy. Um, it's actually, uh, the site is geared to kind of give a quick overview to psychiatrists or therapists to learn more about how they might integrate some of those approaches into their practice. Um, but Dr. Frank recommended that these are some things that individuals themselves could participate in and, and great, could gain quite a bit of benefit from it. If you're not familiar with interpersonal social rhythm therapy, it has a lot to do with managing your schedule um, uh, and um, managing your sleep and so special time for interactions and things of that nature. So all those things that Donna reviewed in those personal wellness strategies, or many of those things that Donna reviewed in the personal wellness strategies pieces, um, are covered in interpersonal social rhythm therapy as well. And so you may find that uh, website particularly helpful. Um, Donna or um, Alan, do you have any other recommendations for some things? I know we did mention some of the apps which were for the ECBT, uh, which is the cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Sure. I, I uh, really 
am sorry to hear that the you know focus is um, singular. I, I think all too often, unfortunately, the uh, community behavioral health centers um, that are um, working with people that may have economic disadvantage um, are experiencing incredibly high volumes. And it's not to make an excuse. It, it's just that then when appointment times are very brief um, and you are seeing someone who's prescribing, the interaction can you know, really just scratch the surface of details about such medications and not get beyond that. Um, and so I, I really feel for you, I would say, first and foremost. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things to consider. Um, the, the first may be um, to really voice within the context of the appointment um, that you, you feel urgently that you want to augment what you're doing pharmacologically with something um, additional and specifically talk therapy and, you know, inquiring if there are uh, options for talk therapy within that community behavioral health center is, is the first thing. Um, then there's also uh, potentially the, um, you know, structured groups that may be facilitated by a mental health professional. Those can provide some of the psychoeducation and therapeutic um, benefits because you do have a, a clinical professional there, um, whereas you know, peer support groups like DBSA groups you know, don't have the professional, and they provide, a, I think, a different kind of um, benefit. Uh, uh, but I think that the group setting is one, if, if not you know, the more ideal one-on-one -on -one experience to um, you know, have the, the facilitated group can be something to consider. Additionally, I think it can be useful to um, consider whether there might be a uh, telepsychiatry option that the Community Behavioral Health Center uh, knows of and works with. That can be something to which they could refer you depending upon the area and, and what um, uh, structures they have in that center. So, um, you know, I think asking and advocating for it, and if we can find out maybe what area you're in later offline, I might be able to dig a little more. But uh, I, I'm sorry for that situation. It's too bad. Um, an experience, or some experiences that I've had with um, clinicians and also things that I've heard from other people with personal lived experience is sometimes it's been helpful to sit down and ourselves write out our wellness plan. And you can do that again on the DDSA wellness tracker. Um, or some of the other wellness recovery plans, and bring a copy of that in to present to the clinician and then explain, here are the different elements of my life that are important to me in my recovery, and I appreciate the medication management that you're doing. Can you help me to find the resources for the other parts of my wellness and recovery plan. Because I've, I have heard from some clinicians that they are actually startled by the depth and breadth of our plans and looking at other parts of our lives because some of them say quite regretfully, wow, you know, I have such short appointment windows and I only get to ask a few questions about signs and symptoms and side effects and meds. And, you know, it, it just doesn't seem like they get to know the person well. So some people have said they've had some success doing that because then the clinician says, oh, okay, well, let's take a look and see if we can find some of these other resources. Great. Thank you, Donna. And just wanted to do a quick clarification for everyone. There's two, two different tools on facingus.org, which is the DBSA wellness community site. There's one that's the wellness plan, which helps you outline exactly what your goals and objectives are for your, um, what, how you define wellness. And then there's also the, the DBSA wellness tracker, which then monitors your progress in relationship to your treatment and how you're doing related to your goals. So those, that's a quick clarification. And just follow up with that on this last piece, um, there are probably some services that are available through you to those two community, well, through the community resources that we had um, uh, stated earlier to, both through Thresholds and um, International Clubhouses. So that's another 
some options for individuals as well. Um, and I wanted to follow up with a question that was um, talking about follow through. And I think Donna, in particular, with your experience being a peer specialist, would be particularly relevant. You could lend some advice on this. Um, the person uh, asked that most people have a problem with follow through, especially during the low times. Do you know of a resource for an accountability an accountability buddy? Ah, you know that's something that is so important to me too. Um, there is the no tech or low tech um, approach that I sometimes use, which is I say to some people in my life, some friends, I will just announce. I am going to, I want to, and then um, encourage them to hold me accountable, accountable now that I've, I've done it. Um, sometimes I try to recruit them in whatever it is that I'm struggling to do to join with me because I find it easier to do it with other people than to do it all on my own. And then I think um, some of these sites online that um, we were mentioning, and I'm trying to go back and find exactly which site it was. Um, the one that has the really upbeat, exciting. Um, I think it's Super Better Me or Super Better. Yeah, I think so. But okay. it's again, if anyone hadn't caught that earlier, this this um, PowerPoint is available for download. So all of the sites will be uh, you can. Uh, reference those in the in the download. So, so um, Donna, was that that was it? That was, I think, it at, at that point. I like I said, I tend to go with the no tech or the low tech, and um, and compare things like. Um, number of steps walked on my pedometer with somebody else. For me, a Fitbit hasn't worked or anything high tech. Um, or people who um, I, I tell them, I let them know this is an area where I need some support and can you give it to me? Will you give it to me? And I've found that when I reach out and ask people in my network of support, they actually do it. Yeah, I think, as you said, if they're presented the question, it's most often uh, individuals, whether it's peer support, community resources, or clinicians will be much more inclined to be able to provide something for you. So um, I wanted to follow up real quickly because we are running out of time. Um, a couple of individuals had also suggested some other apps that they found helpful to them um, for happiness website. Uh, someone recommended HappyFi, H-A-P-P-I-F-Y dot com. And someone else suggested um, a site called for meditation called The Smiling Mind. And Ooh. so those are some additional uh, apps or, and or websites, as Donna mentioned, that you might want to check out. Um, and unfortunately... Um, let me quick go through. I think we might have time for one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, so this is one that an individual asked about, how do you manage um, suggestions for living up to work expectations um, and how you integrate that? So that's, um, I think we're going to wrap with that one. Um, Donna or Alan, would you like to address that? Hmm. Alan? Sorry, I was on mute. So in terms of addressing the specific work expectations, is that the question? Yeah, I think it would be more about are there any tools that you found that would be helpful to an individual um, to navigate expectations for them at work? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think that it's sort of dividing in, into two parts. Um, unfortunately, I don't know of a resource that's, um, you know, one total and, and integrated source for both the mental health and the workplace objectives. So that that is not something I know of specifically. However, you kind of need to work on both fronts. Your wellness plan objectives are still very much in play. Um, that's something that resonates with me personally because um, a great example is sleep. As soon as I get off track in terms of my 
uh, plans and, and goals and intentions around sleep, I can pretty much guarantee you that my, um, you know, mood will, um, you know, have, have some issues and, and then my um, work function and, and uh, joy in what I'm doing will suffer too. And, and it's an area where you might sacrifice a bit on your wellness thinking that that's going to benefit your work, but really um, over the long term and, and even the short term it can, it can um, backfire. So, so I think that the wellness objectives really are workplace objectives in and of themselves to a certain extent because they support and make them possible. Then on the other hand, I think having um, a, a really rigorous structure for work is what's helpful and making sure you don't isolate in terms of your workplace. I, I think when we have um, you know, depression or other mood-related symptoms, we can tend to isolate and we can tend to have negative self-talk and that makes us um, afraid to reach out and ask for help. Um, it can also get in the way of our organization and follow through. And so I think to um, look for uh, various organizational tools um, you know, that, that keep you, um, you know, in line in terms of your calendar, in terms of your deadlines, um, you know, those will inherently help. But then also asking for help and asking for almost a workplace accountability buddy um, is, is a really healthy and smart thing to do for those of us who experience mood symptoms and are in a workplace. But I will look, I'm, I'm curious now thinking of both of those combined, um, you know, I'm, I'm not having something come to mind, but I'm intrigued and I'm going to look for something. Well, someone suggested Some it would be a great follow-up webinar. I think that's great. Donna, do you want yeah. to have anything before we close? I was just going to say, um, Boston University has done a lot of studies on employment and people in recovery, and I'm wondering if they might be a resource. I also know that the um, University of Illinois Chicago has a workplace resource um, as well, and what we will try to do is um, uh, provide that information online as well for people. So, so with that, I want to say thank you uh, again to our presenters, to Donna and Alan, um, as well as our webinar sponsor, Synovian, and really for all of you for um, your support of and participation in today's and the full series of DBSA's Treatment Choices webinars. Um, the vast majority of you stayed through the Q&A, and I apologize that we ran long, so thank you very much for your participation. And a final reminder that for more information about this webinar, to be able to download the PowerPoint slides and or to watch an archive version, um, either yourself or to refer it to a friend of any of these webinars, um, you can visit dbsalliance.org forward slash webinars. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day.